Hello and welcome everyone to the CVL Science Luncheon Series. Today um, we have a speaker who will be presenting to us through Teams and this is for a very good reason for her. She is a postdoc and she is on a job interview so that deserves some congratulations and she also generously agreed to go ahead and still give us this talk also while she is um, interviewing for a job. Um, so we appreciate that. Um, so today I can welcome to you Dr. Eliza Kalionimi. She is a postdoctoral researcher right now at UT Southwestern Medical School in their Department of Psychiatry. And her previous training has been in biomedical engineering and then a PhD in medical physics. And her main program of research is using neuromodulation techniques such as TMS and TCDS to study disease processes, but then also to help better these techniques. As you know, this is a fairly young um, field and these tools are in much, much need of smart people to uh, work on them and design them and to make them work better. And so that is what today's speaker um, has set her career on. And so without further ado, I will go ahead and um, welcome Dr. Uh, Kalianini. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, coming to this talk and giving me an opportunity. And, and my apologies that I can't be there um, uh, in person. Uh, I have to do other uh, like I'm traveling this week uh, for interviews. Right, so uh, let's get started. Right, so uh, in this talk, uh, I, aim, a, I aim to cover uh, both my research focuses, so how TMS is used to study the brain uh, and how TMS is used to modulate the brain uh, for therapeutic applications. Uh, so to my understanding, the, the Center for Vital Longevity has TMS, um, but the main research method is fMRI. So in my presentation, I will, um, like no worries, I will cover the basics so that we, we are all in the same page. So in the first part of my talk, uh, I will review the technical background of TMS uh, and the basic neural responses induced by TMS and how brain maturation and aging impact the basic responses. Uh, then I will show how the basic responses can be used to develop more advanced methods to study the brain. Uh, in my own research, uh, I have developed a TMS methods mainly to study the primary motor cortex. Uh, so I will be presenting applications uh, based on that, uh, but similar principles apply to other uh, brain areas. And in the second part, uh, I will present how TMS can modulate the brain for therapeutic purposes and what kind of neural effects the therapeutic applications could have. Right, so uh, before going to the details of TMS, so the, the neuromodulation technique that I'm presenting today, uh, I just want to highlight the, the peak picture and the, the importance of developing uh, brain stimulation in general and its applications for brain disorders and aging. So as we all know, the, uh, the first treatment given to almost uh, any brain disorder is some pharmaceutical. And what is uh, less known is that some people experience intolerable side effects from pharmaceuticals um, because pharmaceuticals affect the whole brain. Uh, we cannot restrict them to a certain area. Uh, and for some, ph some individuals, the, the pharmaceuticals simply don't work. Uh, meaning that some individuals don't have effective treatments. So, for example, uh, in individuals with depression, uh, up to 30% do not benefit from uh, currently available pharmaceuticals. And depression impacts around 300 million people worldwide. So potentially in depression alone, uh, we have approximately 100 million individuals who do not have effective treatments currently. And uh, TMS uh, is one of the promising non-invasive brain stimulation techniques uh, that could answer many of the current challenges of treating brain disorders uh, because it does not have a long lasting side effects and it can treat uh, some individuals who are resistant to pharmaceuticals. Uh, also considering the applications uh, with TMS, we can be very selective on its effects and we can also use it to study the brain. So let's start by looking at how TMS works because that's very important to understand the rest of my uh, presentation. So TMS applies rapidly changing magnetic fields 
uh, with the aim of inducing short lasting electric fields in the brain uh, by electromagnetic induction. Uh, if this induced electric field is above a certain threshold, uh, it will create action potentials and thus activate the brain. So basically with TMS, we apply externally uh, electricity to the brain to activate it. And then I will just show like a, the basic principle of TMS. This, sorry if this is too, too much engineering, please bear with me. So TMS is a very simple tool. So basically in TMS, we just have two things. We have a capacitor and a coil. And when we, we the idea is that we discharge the capacitor and the current exits uh, toward the coil in the circuit. And when the current reaches the coil, it induces a magnetic field around the coil. And then the magnetic field reaches the surface of the brain and it, it, it induces a small electric field. So this is this whole procedure is basically one TMS pulse, and this is all what TMS does. So we just basically discharge um, capacitor and induce magnetic fields. Right, so let's have a look at what kind of uh, like what does TMS equipment look like? So here I'm presenting a magnetic uh, resonance imaging MRI for short a guided TMS system and we have the stimulator that has the capacitor and the stimulator is connected to a coil that converts the current into magnetic fields uh, and does the simulation. And the purpose of the MRI guided system is to show us the location of the TMS coil and the estimate of the induced electric field in a 3D head model uh, in real time. Uh, the navigation in TMS is implemented via these reflective spheres uh, that are attached to the coil, but also to the participant's forehead. And the location of these spheres uh, is monitored online via an infrared camera. And all the studies I will present today ha have been conducted with a system similar to this. I'm not sure whether the system at your center is with a neural navigation, but I would think that it's something similar. Right, and then a short introduction on what can we modify in TMS when we provide the stimulation so you understand better how TMS methods are developed. So methods, uh, as I, I, um, part of my research is basically method development. So hopefully this is not uh, too much engineering, but, but please uh, bear with me. So uh, the first thing is pulse waveform, and depending on pulse waveform, we get different induced electric fields and different neural effects in the brain. So for example, uh, we can create focal stimulation with a monophasic waveform, uh, which just has one peak uh, because the electric field is toward one direction only. With biphasic waveform that has two peaks, uh, we can create strong activation because we basically stimulate the same location twice. Uh, with TMS, we can also modify the pulse strength uh, to change the induced electric field strength. And what happens with increasing pulse strength is that both the induced electric field strength in the brain and the impacted area increase as shown in the top figure. And what is important is that the induced electric field in TMS is always on the surface of the brain as shown here below. Uh, the electric field does not impact the subcortical areas uh, in TMS because the, the magnetic fields that we apply uh, decrease exponentially. Uh, and that is important uh, because it also increases the safety uh, of the stimulation. So if the electricity would be induced to deeper regions, that would potentially start causing uh, side effects. So because the electric field in TMS is re restricted to the surface, um, we consider that there's no long-term side effects and TMS is pretty low risk method. Right, and we can also modify the coil shape that administers the stimulation. So because the magnetic field will be around the coil, uh, the induced electric field will be under the coil. So for example, if we have a circular TMS coil, the induced electric field will be circular in the brain. So basically with a circular coil, we don't stimulate a small spot, but we could, for example, stimulate both hemispheres at the same time. Uh, then, for example, with a figure of eight coil, uh, that is just two circular coils next to each other, uh, we can create a focal point to the center, uh, making the stimulation focal. 
And finally, so we can also modify um, the induced electric field direction uh, by changing the coil orientation. So for TMS to induce action potentials, the TMS induced electric field needs to be able to create a gradient in the electrical charges along an axon. And two most likely possibilities when this could happen uh, are when an axon terminates or bends uh, and the electric field is initially parallel to the action. Uh, as the surface of the brain has a unique structure at, e at each point uh, due to all the ridges and faults, uh, at each location there probably is the most uh, optimal uh, orientation for TMS and in some coil orientations we most likely do not induce much activations. And finally, uh, so we can also modify the time between two TMS pulses. So the time between the pulses is the only thing that separates when we're using TMS to study the brain and when we're modulating the brain uh, for therapeutic purposes. So uh, when we give uh, TMS pulses so that the time between the two pulses is several seconds, uh, there are no uh, modulatory effects. So each pulse's effects are independent of another and we can use this to study the brain. Uh, we can also give TMS pulses in small groups, uh, for example, two pulses at a time, and then separate each group with several seconds from the next one. Uh, in this case, we're modulating the brain, uh, but only uh, during the group of pulses to evaluate short-term dynamics. Uh, finally, uh, if we give several pulses without a long pauses and continue that for a long time, uh, and repeat it over several days, the, the stimulation becomes a therapeutic protocol. And depending on the exact time between the pulses, uh, the modulatory effects could be either inhibitory or excitatory, and I will get back to that a bit later. Right, so now that we have looked at the technical side of TMS, uh, let's have a look at what happens uh, after a TMS pulse is targeted to the brain. Uh, first through electroencephalography, uh, which measures the brain's uh, electrical activity. So here, uh, TMS pulse was administered at time zero, and after the pulse, uh, we got a response with negative and positive peaks. So uh, the unique feature of this response is that the peaks uh, represent the function of uh, different neurotransmitter systems, uh, and neurotransmitters are molecules used by the, the nervous system to transmit uh, messages uh, between neurons. So with TMS, we can actually separate the excitatory glutamergic system, so the, the system that initiates brain activity, uh, and the inhibitory GABAergic system, so the system that uh, stops uh, brain activity. And we can even uh, differentiate GABA-A uh, and GABA-B, so GABA-A system mediates the fast inhibitory signals, whereas GABA-B mediates the slower ones. So when a TMS pulse is given, uh, it basically initiates a process in the brain in which the activation of excitatory and inhibitory systems uh, take turns. And uh, why I've written a potentially glutamergic uh, in this figure is because uh, currently there's a little bit of uh, controversial evidence, but the majority of the studies point toward a glutamergic uh, origin in these peaks. Right, so as brain maturation and aging uh, are your main interests, I will just briefly go through what do we currently know, how do they affect uh, TMS EEG responses. So unfortunately, I must say that there isn't much that we know. Uh, and for those who are more interested in the topic, uh, I encourage you to, to read my recent review uh, in which I summarized all existing studies so far. And it covers uh, both studies in typical and atypical uh, brain maturation and aging. And just a side note here, uh, so TMS is safe across the lifespan. Uh, so, so far, uh, TMS as a method uh, to study the brain, it has been applied in three months uh, old infants and up to 90 year, uh, 90 year old uh, geriatrics. Right. So, as you know, the, the central nervous system uh, undergoes uh, major structural and connectional changes during the first uh, decades of life. And these uh, structural changes involve uh, the reorganization of excitatory and inhibitory circuits, which are the most important circuits for, uh, in TMS. 
Also, physiological and pathological brain aging uh, are characterized by changes that directly affect uh, brain plasticity, such as changes in cellular connect connectivity. And because this, uh, there are these changes across the lifespan, also how the brain responds to TMS uh, changes substantially across the lifespan. Um, here we have uh, average responses from a child, uh, adolescent and adult from my research, and we can see how the response size decreases. And these are single pulses. So um, I think these were 200 single pulses average uh, together or something like that. And these responses are from the primary motor cortex. Uh, also, the child and adolescent uh, responses are missing some of the peaks uh, that you can't really see in this figure, but the child and adolescent uh, are missing, namely the GABA-A, uh, so the uh, fast inhibitory response and the other glutamagic response around 60 milliseconds uh, after the TMS pulse. And each uh, brain area responds to TMS uh, slightly differently across the lifespan. So here are comparisons from the motor and uh, frontal brain areas uh, across the lifespan after single pulse uh, TMS. So the, uh, the and the response values in this uh, figure have been squared to make them easier to visualize. Uh, in the motor areas, uh, brain maturation and aging, uh, as shown earlier, uh, decrease the responses, uh, whereas in the frontal areas, and, and, by, and by frontal I mean dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, the, the responses are not that different. Uh, and what actually changes is how the responses are spread in the brain. And currently only the primary motor cortex and the left uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortices have been studied across the lifespan uh, with TMS. Uh, my colleagues and I have uh, data from the parietal cortex, uh, but we haven't had the chance to uh, finalize the analysis yet. So basically, just to uh, emphasize that um, with TMS, we know very little about how the responses change across the lifespan. So because the brain responses to TMS are so sensitive to brain area, uh, neurotransmitter system, uh, brain maturation and aging, uh, we can actually use these responses as uh, potential biomarkers. Uh, so for example, here are squared response values from an individual with Alzheimer's disease uh, and a healthy uh, control subject. Uh, the responses are quite different and have uh, different peaks. And we can actually distinguish the two conditions. Uh, at the individual level, the responses to TMS are also very repeatable. However, the challenge in the field is currently that uh, we don't have any standardized methods to measure or analyze uh, TMS evoked responses. And unfortunately, how you measure and analyze the responses impacts somewhat uh, to the outcome. So also TMS uh, as a biomarker is uh, promising and has some challenges, but, but the uh, field is very well aware of these uh, challenges and, and um, I'm currently um, involved in this kind of like international effort uh, in which uh, several TMS EEG labs around the world are tackling this and we're uh, basically preparing a guidelines paper trying to standardize uh, the protocols. Right. So, uh, but as I, as I said, so TMS EEG has a lot of promises uh, as a biomarker and, and I want to present a recent article by my colleagues uh, Ferrari et al uh, from Italy uh, that truly show the potential of uh, TMS EEG as a biomarker in aging research. Uh, and it is the only study so far that has been conducted in, in a longitudinal fashion. So in this study, a uh, subject with amnestic mild cognitive impairment were followed for six years. Uh, they then identified individuals with amnestic mild cognitive impairment who clinically converted to Al Alzheimer's disease and those who remained uh, cognitively stable. And what the study found was that the, the TMS EEG responses could actually predict at baseline, so six years before the individuals with amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment uh, converted to Alzheimer's disease from those who remained cognitively stable, which is remarkable. So in this study, TMS was targeted to the sensory motor cortex and the response is shown here again as uh, squared. Uh, so this is, of course, uh, only a preliminary finding and it has not been replicated yet. 
and it only contained uh, 13 participants. But if this will be re replicated, it will be, of course, like a significant advancement for aging and Alzheimer's research uh, as measuring TMS EEG responses is a very low cost method. So six years before you turn into Alzheimer's patients, you would know um, like who will convert and who will not. Right, so then uh, let's have a look at other responses that we can evoke with TMS. So in addition to EEG, uh, we can also combine muscle responses with TMS. Um, so if we target the TMS um, to the primary motor cortex with sufficient pulse strength, um, we get a motor response. And if the, the target muscle is at rest, uh, we get a motor evoked potential, so MEP. And if the target muscle is contracted, we get an MEP followed by a silent period when there is no muscle activity at all. And the MEP is an excitatory response, and it describes the activity of the glutamergic system. Uh, SB, on the contrary, describes the activity of the inhibitory GABAergic system, both GABA-A and GABA-B. We cannot really in, like, uh, differentiate them uh, with SBs. So by changing the state of the target muscle, we can decide which system in the brain we're mainly interested in, uh, excitatory or inhibitory. And how do the TMS evoked motor responses uh, change with uh, brain maturation and aging? Uh, so the excite excitatory MEP response amplitude actually increases as a function of age, whereas the inhibitory response SP uh, duration here on the right uh, decreases uh, with increasing age. Right, so now we have looked at the technical side of TMS uh, and the two uh, basic res uh, neurophysiological uh, responses. Uh, next, let's look at how we can use this uh, to develop methods to study the brain beyond the basic responses. And I will be presenting two applications. Uh, both are designed to study the primary motor cortex, but of course, like I said, similar principles apply also to other um, brain areas. So the first application that I would like to present today is functional motor mapping uh, that could have uh, both neuroscientific and clinical applications. So in a healthy individual, the, the primary motor cortex, which is responsible for a motor function, is quite easy to find as it is commonly located on the precentral gyrus. Uh, locating the primary motor cortex, for example, in individuals with brain tumors near or on the motor cortex becomes a lot more challenging uh, as the tumor could push the motor areas uh, to very unexpected locations. Um, if the tumor will be removed or treated with radiotherapy, uh, it might be important to know where the motor areas are. Uh, and this is because if uh, the patient's motor areas are near the tumor, when the tumor is removed, uh, some of the motor areas might also be removed and the patient might lose uh, some of the motor function. Also, if the, uh, the tumor is treated with radiotherapy, uh, there might be effects to the motor function uh, if the motor areas uh, get too much radiation. And I'm just giving uh, brain tumors as an example, but mapping the, the motor areas might be of interest also after, for example, a brain trauma and just understanding uh, plastic changes in the brain caused by brain maturation and aging. And the typical approach to find the motor areas um, employs a task-based uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging, so fMRI for short, uh, with tasks uh, which require patients to execute simple tasks in the scanner, uh, like squeezing a hand or finger tapping. And this task-based fMRI approach is uh, well established and widely used uh, in clinical routine, but it has some limitations. So, uh, which probably you know better than I, if you're experts uh, in fMRI. So, for example, uh, patients must be able to perform the tasks uh, appropriately, and we need uh, trained personnel to to select the proper task for each patient, uh, depending on the tumor location. Uh, additional challenges come if the patient moves in the scanner uh, and from the pathological tissue changes caused by the tumor that could impact the fMRI signal. 
Uh, also, there needs to be a decision uh, which uh, fMRI threshold to use uh, in the maps, uh, which might be tricky uh, because um, this is not group level analysis, but you have to do the analysis for one single uh, individual. And most likely you cannot use the same threshold for each part uh, each patient. So here is this, uh, an example of what individual task based fMRI motor maps look like with a bold and arterial spin labeling fMRI uh, from a comparison study I did. Uh, and these have been thresholded with the same value. Uh, and as you can see, there is huge variability. So imagine being in a clinic and you would have to decide in each one of these uh, patients uh, which area is true uh, act motor activation and which is not. So the person who analyzes this uh, needs to make some sophisticated guesses on how far the motor areas extend. So several of these challenges associated with uh, task-based fMRI uh, can be actually tackled if we use TMS as a motor mapping method. So when we map the motor areas with TMS, um, it basically looks like this. So we give a TMS pulses and test whether that spot induces a motor response. Then we stimulate another location and do the same. And we can basically form a map of the motor area based on the response size. Uh, and in the map, we can identify the center of the map, so where the most prominent motor function is uh, and the extent of the map. And the mapping can be done while the patient sits in a chair and does nothing. Uh, and the data analysis is quite simple because at every location, uh, we're just looking at is there a response or not? Uh, with TMS, you can also separate the excitatory and inhibitory motor maps, uh, but of course, to receive the, the inhibitory motor maps, uh, some patient cooperation is uh, needed because the patient needs to contract the muscles while the pulses are administered. And when we do um, TMS motor mapping, uh, in addition to using the response size to form the maps, uh, we have shown that you could also use, for example, a response latency. So how long does it take after we give the TMS pulse uh, before we can measure a motor response uh, in the peripheral muscle? And this latency shows uh, the most direct, fastest pathways in our, our motor system, uh, but also slow ones, for example, that the tumor might be pressing in the subcortical structures. So in addition to understanding how motor function is distributed on the surface, uh, TMS allows us to obtain subcortical information. So in TMS, um, also the pathological changes uh, near, for example, the tumor uh, could impact the mapping. Uh, namely, in some individuals, we will need a high pulse strength uh, to induce uh, motor activity. Uh, which could make the mapping impossible if the pulse strength is above uh, what we can get from the TMS device. So TMS devices have limits, they can't uh, increase the intensity uh, forever. So in this study we tested, uh, could we fix this by modulating the motor area uh, just before the pulse? So uh, as I showed you earlier, uh, we can also modulate the brain short term with TMS. And we can modulate the um, primary motor cortex through several approaches. And one is to use these uh, descending D and I waves. So these are waves that happen uh, right after TMS is targeted to the motor cortex. And these waves uh, travel from your brain uh, to your spine. And they basically determine what kind of muscle movement is about to happen. And we can modulate these waves non-invasively uh, by giving, for example, two TMS pulses. So First, give one, which initiates the sequence of waves, and then give another when one of these individual waves occur, uh, and that will facilitate the responses. And by applying the modulation to the motor maps, uh, when we modulated the responses, we could get a similar map, um, similar motor map, but with a lower pulse strength. So here, uh, figure A shows an example of an unmodulated map and figure B a uh, modulated map. Uh, so in this particular individual, uh, we could decrease the TMS pulse strength, uh, the, the required TMS pulse strength from 58 uh, to 51. 
And this is huge in TMS, so even it's only seven percentage, but it makes a huge difference. So this means that even though we modulate the responses with TMS short term, uh, with this approach, we do not change the underlying functionality, which is make it more easily accessible and we can overcome the issue uh, caused by pathological changes. Um, so to summarize the TMS motor mapping section, uh, so we have shown that TMS can obtain both uh, cortical and subcortical information uh, of the motor function and by small adjustments, so playing with features of the electric field, uh, we can make the motor maps uh, more accessible and TMS could be a potential alternative uh, for ta task-based fMRI, at least in this particular application. So the second TMS application that I would like to present today uh, is based on an idea uh, of could TMS be used as a structural tool and thus uh, used to study local brain structure. And as I showed you earlier, uh, for TMS to activate the axons, the, the induced uh, electric field needs to be able to create a gradient in the electrical charges along an axon. Uh, so, and this most likely occurs uh, when the axon terminates or bends uh, within the electric field. So TMS has directions that it prefers and directions that do not cause activation. And uh, we tested this idea uh, by stimulating a single location on the primary motor cortex, but by turning the TMS coil uh, along an arc and constantly measuring uh, evoked motor responses. And these were measured from the peripheral uh, muscle. Uh, and as I showed you earlier, when we changed the coil direction, we also changed the induced um, the direction of the induced electric field. So at each location, when we change the coil uh, orientation, we also um, stimulate the neurons from slightly different angle. So we basically um, look at like where are the optimal places for with, from TMS perspective. And in this study, we got these uh, bell-shaped curves uh, in which the peak is the optimal direction for TMS to stimulate this particular uh, location. And from there, the, the stimulation changes to non-optimal. And we, ba uh, we basically modeled this uh, by fitting a Gaussian curve to them. And then we developed an equation to characterize the Gaussian fitted curve. Uh, so we named this as anisotropy index, so AI for short, uh, because it tells us the preferred direction of TMS. And this equation allows us to use uh, this AI in a way that the wider the curve, uh, the closer the AI is to zero, which means that there are no single direction which TMS prefers to activate. Whereas when this curve is very narrow and TMS um, clearly prefers to activate only certain directions, the AI is close to one. And what we found was that this AI uh, was actually very repeat repeatable and it correlated with the fractional anisotropy of the stimulated area. Uh, and fractional anisotropy is a measure from diffusion tensor imaging, so which basically it, it reflects how anisotropic a white matter is. So basically how, how anisotropic the axons are. So this connection suggests that in fact uh, TMS can measure structural features. This, this measure AI also correlated with how excitable the stimulated area was. Uh, so it re reflects the, the functional state of the cortex. So, so there was a connection in this measure both with structure and function. And we wanted to test this method uh, in chronic stroke patients uh, because a stroke um, conveniently causes both uh, functional and structural changes to the brain, uh, which change over time. And we recruited uh, individuals who had a few millimeter uh, stroke uh, lesion. Uh, so basically a few millimeters of dead tissue in the primary motor cortex, uh, either hemisphere. And this type of uh, stroke is quite rare, so we could easily only recruit five individuals. So because the lesion is a dead tissue, uh, it should not evoke any responses and thus the lesion side of the, so the affected side should have a higher AI because it has less direction in, in which there should come responses. So as you can see in this sample, 
uh, AI could find the affected hemisphere in, in all five patients, uh, as, in, as the AI of the affected hemisphere was higher than that of the unaffected hemisphere uh, in all patients as predicted. Um, this is, of course, obviously just a preliminary result uh, due to small sample size, but still shows that with this kind of TMS method, we can potentially also evaluate changes in cortical structure uh, that could be useful, for example, to study brain disorders that are associated with small uh, structural changes over time. So potentially we wouldn't have to do MRI uh, all the time. Right, so uh, this wraps up the first part of my talk on how TMS could be used to study the brain. So before the next part, um, I just want to summarize the main points of using TMS as a tool to study the brain, which are, so TMS is non-invasive, a low-risk method that can be applied across the lifespan, and TMS can measure functional and structural features of the cortex, uh, and TMS can separate inhibitor and excitatory systems. So Basically, uh, with TMS, both the neuroscientific and diagnostic applications are endless. Uh, you just have to play with the um, electrical field features. Right, so now that we have looked at how TMS could be used to study the brain, uh, let's have a look at how it could be used as a therapeutic tool. And I just want to remind you that uh, when we talk about TMS as a therapeutic tool, um, all the same principles with changing electric field, uh, prince, uh, electric field parameters apply, uh, as in studying the brain. So the only difference is that the time between the pulses is smaller. And I also uh, want to emphasize that TMS is merely a tool to induce uh, electric fields to the brain. But the actual therapeutic protocol is the applied electric field and whatever parameters we choose to apply. So with different uh, set of parameters, we get very different results. So if you ever read an article that says that TMS does not work in this disorder, you should not um, believe them. You should just think that the, the protocol that they applied did not work, but it doesn't mean that TMS cannot work. So currently there are uh, four FDA approved uh, TMS uh, treatments. So the first uh, TMS protocol was approved uh, for treatment resistant depression uh, already in 2008. Uh, then another protocol was approved uh, for pain uh, associated with certain migraine headaches in 2013. Uh, there was an uh, for obsessive uh, compulsive disorder approval was, was received in 2018 and for short-term smoking cessation in 2020. So although TMS is not generally a very well-known uh, method, there are already numerous uh, clinics around the country uh, providing it as a, a therapeutic um, protocol, but it's still very much uh, limited to severe psychiatric disorders uh, because those are the currently the most uh, developed protocols. And in addition to these, uh, TMS is widely used for other disorders as a kind of like an experimental off-label protocol, such as uh, stroke, uh, pain, epilepsy, tinnitus, uh, schizophrenia, uh, bipolar disorder, and the, the newest application uh, is the cognitive dysfunction in long COVID. And why, of course, these uh, disorders have not been FDA approved yet with TMS is because we, we don't, even though we have promising evidence um, to have FDA approval, you need to have large um, data sets and um, it hasn't been done yet. And of course, TMS cannot be used to everything, so there needs to be something wrong in the brain function, especially either in the excitatory or inhibitory systems or both uh, for TMS to be considered as a treatment. And most likely, uh, TMS cannot uh, fully fix the underlying pathologics, so the effects are based on small changes that change the abnormal brain function a little bit toward uh, the healthy function, and that could already initiate a cascade of events uh, that compensate the original pathology and lead to improvements in symptoms. And in healthy subjects, we can also use a few uh, therapeutic sessions safely uh, to improve uh, functions like cognition uh, for a little while. However, um, in healthy subjects, we do not really know uh, the upper limit uh, of stimulation. So 
if a healthy individual receives uh, too much uh, TMS, so too much stimulation, it could actually happen that they start developing symptoms of some brain disorders. Right, so um, then let's have a look at what kind of uh, effects can we have uh, when we use TMS as a therapeutic protocol. So basically when we have when the aim is to modulate the brain and I'll be uh, focusing on the effects on the brain and not to the symptoms to keep this more general. And because I've been working in psychiatry, the data I will show you uh, are in individuals with psychiatric disorders, uh, but similar effects in the brain can be seen in any brain disorder. Uh, so firstly, TMS is able to inhibit or excite brain function. And usually a low pulse frequencies close to one hertz uh, inhibit brain function and high frequencies around um, 10 to 20 hertz uh, excited. And here is some data from uh, individuals with uh, schizophrenia who underwent a high frequency TMS uh, treatment uh, each weekday for three weeks. And there, this data shows their absolute EEG power. So electrical brain activity was measured uh, before and after. And what we found was that in both individuals with a low baseline EEG and high baseline EEG, the EEG increased and near the stimulated area. And this is an important feature of TMS because in many brain disorders, uh, we have abnormal brain activity levels, but also subgroups that have different activity levels and the effects were not dependent on the activity level. And another ability of TMS uh, is to normalize abnormal brain function. So this is motor response data from the same individuals with schizophrenia who underwent uh, three weeks of high frequency TMS. And to study the brain function, we applied a protocol that included 10 TMS pulses and those, and those were repeated 10 times. And this kind of uh, protocol evaluates the short term plasticity of the cortex. And as we can see in this figure, uh, before any treatment, uh, the healthy individuals, so these uh, individuals um, marked with um, green color, uh, had a smooth uh, decreasing response to TMS pulses. Uh, individuals with schizophrenia, however, had a sawtooth-like response. So every other response was large and every other response was small. So basically these individuals couldn't react to every, um, every single TMS pulse. And this figure shows the same response, but after the individuals with schizophrenia received treatment. So these are responses from those who received active treatment uh, with, uh, and those are marked with black color and those who received sham are marked with a red color. And as we can see in the active TMS group, um, the sore tools like response has been somewhat normalized, uh, whereas in the sham control, it is still evident. So, Basically what happened is that in the active group, we changed something in their thalamocortical circuits um, that led to these changes in motor function. However, we don't know how long these uh, changes last. So these were measured right after the uh, therapeutic uh, sessions. And interestingly, TMS um, could also change uh, brain anatomy. So this figure shows the voxel-based morphometry results uh, from individuals with depression. Uh, who underwent five weeks of TMS treatments. Um, and voxel-based morphometry evaluates um, local concentration of gray matter. Uh, and the treatment was provided to both uh, frontal hemispheres and active treatment was compared to sham. And the active treatments, um, as you can see, the, so the changes are the, that uh, colorful orange blob. So the active treatments changed uh, gray matter concentration on the right sensory motor cortex uh, we don't know why the gray matter changes are on the right sensory motor cortex um, because we stimulated the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, not the um, motor area. But this is shows that TMS effects are widespread and induce um, effects across the brain networks. Um, individuals with depression commonly have, for example, a low reaction time. So depression is also associated with some motor abnormalities. So it could be that the uh, the treatment actually impacted that and which resulted in changes in um, gray matter uh, structure. But unfortunately, we didn't measure any um, reaction times or anything other than that. Right, so uh, now that we have looked at uh, some of the possibilities of TMS uh, treatments, 
I just want to cause you also about the challenges. So it's not um, like there's still a lot to be done with TMS. So the biggest challenge is that if we provide the same uh, modulatory protocol for all participants, uh, we see this uh, phenomenon that the individuals uh, respond very differently to the protocols. So in this figure, uh, individuals who have been marked with uh, different colors uh, received three different protocols and the motor responses were measured uh, during the stimulation. And the difference between this, these protocols was only the time between the pulses and the, the changes in time were very small. And as you can see, uh, there are no trends how the individuals react. So in some individuals with increasing time between the pulses, the responses get smaller, in some individuals higher, and in some, in some individuals it's something in between. So, and, and these were health individuals. So even though single pulse uh, responses to TMS are very repeatable, um, if we look at model, modulatory response, like what happens if we give a small modulatory, um, like the, try to mod modulate the, the brain, the responses differ. And similar um, between subject variability can be seen, for example, in these uh, stimulus response curves, uh, and these were the same protocols that I, as I showed you earlier. So on the x-axis, we have uh, increasing pulse strength, and on the y-axis, uh, motor response size, and different colors represent uh, different protocols that varied in this time between the pulses. And how you read these figures is that the more to the left uh, the curve is with a certain protocol, uh, the more it is able to activate the excitatory brain system. And as you can see in each individual, uh, the colored curves are in a bit different order. So this means that the same protocols lead to different effects in different individuals, uh, which of course also means that different protocols uh, lead to similar effects in some individuals. And to support the notion that to basically create uh, similar effects in some individuals with TMS, uh, we will need different protocols. Uh, in another study, uh, we found that when we separate the individuals to t uh, TMS uh, treatment responders and non-responders, uh, and responses are here described as a 50% reduction in clinical symptoms, uh, the neural characteristics of the individuals differed uh, before the treatment. So in this case, uh, these were individuals with depression uh, and the differences were noted in a special uh, inhibitory response. So in the responder group, um, there was something optimal in the inhibitory system of these individuals, uh, why this particular TMS protocol could decrease the symptoms, whereas in the non-responders, the interaction between their inhibitory system and the chosen treatment protocol was not optimal. They could, however, like I said previously, they could, however, benefit from slightly different uh, TMS protocol. Right, so uh, that ends up uh, the part in using TMS as a therapeutic uh, tool. Uh, and the most important take home messages that I would like you to have uh, are that so TMS can change uh, brain function and structure and decrease symptoms. Uh, individuals react very differently to TMS, however, which is a, a challenge. For example, if you if you use uh, if you use it as a research protocol, uh, and finally, uh, TMS responders and non-responders uh, differ in neural characteristics. So here's here are my acknowledgments and. Thank you so much for your attention and happy to take any questions. Stand up here so you don't feel like you're talking to nobody. Um, I have some questions, but I figure I'd let people from the room go first. Yeah. Um, do we have any idea or do you have any idea on what can explain the, the differences in who is a responder versus who isn't a responder? That explain that kind of the variability? Yeah, it's a good question. Unfortunately, there could be numerous uh, things that could affect. So currently we know that, for example, how you respond to TMS, like uh, it, it's impacted by your genetics. Uh, for example, your brain structure. Um, it could be small molecular things or something like that, but um, 
it's something that um, the field needs to study more. So we currently don't really have uh, understanding. We only only know that um, individuals differ, uh, like how they respond, but we we don't have like a ultimate truth uh, why. Yeah, I, that, that was similar to one of my questions actually. Um, I was wondering what it was about the the spacing of the pulses that made the difference in the individual um, differences. Do you think that speaks anyway to like differences in local connectivity and some type of like spreading rate or do you think that has anything to do with it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it could be and also like uh, so basically what it like kind of like what is the like the direct thing? What it means is that uh, individuals differ. How much time does it take for them to kind of like recover for one TMS pulse? So in some individuals, most likely there were some cumulative effects. So basically the, the, the neurons that we stimulated hadn't really recovered from the previous pulse. So it could be also kind of like um, these kind of very small differences in neur neural characteristics or like you said, like uh, some sort of uh, network uh, features. That's really interesting. Other questions from people in the room? Yeah. Uh, I was just really curious in your lifespan study, you just have adults. What was the average age of your adults? And since we study older adults, do you have any idea how how this might change as people get older? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so yeah, so in our study we had, so we had ch uh, children, uh, adolescents and adults, but uh, you're absolutely right. So our adults were, um, I would say 25 to 40 year old. So we didn't have uh, like older subjects. Uh, basically with pathological aging like an, or like a typical aging even, uh, there's not many changes in the peaks. Uh, basically the, the changes occur more on how uh, the responses um, kind of like are distributed in the brain uh, networks. So the, it, it's not so evident um, as in like brain maturation. Yeah. And that makes some sense because a lot of <clears throat> current aging research is really honing in on there's quite a, <clears throat> I'm sorry, quite a, um, quite a decline with the brain's um, inhibition properties, whichever way you study it um, yeah. as we get older and older. Uh, and so that makes sense. I have one last question for you, if you don't mind. Um, in your VBM study, I wasn't exactly sure what you were showing. Mean, we understand VBM, we do structural imaging here too, but I wasn't understanding exactly what your experiment was showing. Was Were you showing like the amount of, of gray matter pre and post stimulation and that, that was different? Um, I, I get that it was somewhere else in the brain than when stimulated. I just, I didn't quite get um, that design and what you were showing. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So yeah, just, so it was a pre-post uh, difference uh, to show kind of like where did we see uh, gray matter changes. So with TMS, uh, so so far there has been a few studies showing gray matter changes after kind of like a therapeutic protocols, but they're never near the stimulation, which is super weird. They're always further away, uh, but there's no answer basically um, or logic, like where do they are? Um, so yeah, so it is. It was showing the difference, um, and in that particular uh, study, the the differences in cray matter were uh, on the sensory motor cortex. Okay, and then that was denser than pre stimulation. Yeah, and it was in the same region across all the participants. Yeah, so 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 this was a group level analysis. We didn't uh, do um, individual level. So this was what was shown in the like a, a group level. Gotcha. OK, yeah, that makes sense. OK. Yeah. Any other questions from in the room? Let me check real quick to see if we have any questions from our online audience. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, no questions online. OK. All right, well, thank you so much for um, giving us this talk and um, good luck with your interviews. That's exciting. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, take care. Thank you, bye-bye.